The Susan Brenda Show is a radio show online broadcasted on YouTube across the United States and globally. The show features guests who speak about health, spirituality, entertainment, and a host of subjects to enlighten people across the nation. Listen to the show that empowers women and men alike and highlights those who have made a difference. I'm Susan Brenda, and this is The Susan Brenda Show, and I have an old friend on the show. Michael Solomon is a radio and TV political analyst, former NYP detective, and best-selling, award-winning author of seven books. Welcome to the show, Michael. It's been a pleasure to have you on. You're a good friend of the show, and I'm so proud to have you on. Well, thank you, Susan. It's always a pleasure to be here and to be with you. Thank you. Okay, Michael, let's talk about your most recent books. Give us the title and what it's about. Well, my most recent book is titled Allegory. The subtitle is How One Man's Lies, Deceit, Arrogance, and Greed Has Gaslighted the World. And it basically takes on what I call the scam, the international scam of climate change, because it is a scam and it's all about the money. And that's basically basically what it is. The way I got the title of the book, if you believe it or not, is if you look at the dictionary definition of allegory, it's a story or poem or picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning, typical, um, typically a moral or a political one. That's according to the Oxford Dictionary. Does allegory sound like Al Gore? <laughs> Now the yes, only letter, the only letter, the only letter that's an allegory that's not in his name is the Y, and the whole the whole premise of the book is Y Al. And <laughs> I go through the whole thing. It's all about the money. Tell us about Al Gore. Tell us about Al Gore. What's what's there to know? The man, uh, the man is a, is a liar by omission. I won't call him a liar directly, but he's a liar by omission. Perfect example is when he was testifying in Congress on climate. And he was saying that uh, that uh, in 2010 there were more uh, money. There was more money paid out because of hurricane damage due to hurricanes by insurance companies than any years before. But what he omitted to say was that the population increased by almost 40 percent, and the housing prices went up by about practically doubled. So of course the money was going to be there, but he left that out. That's a testimony. In Congress, the people people can actually go online and see. So, you know, it's amazing. Um, Let me ask you something about Al Gore. Al Gore owns um, a lot of land, and he's involved in, in, in a lot of different industries. Why is he talking about climate change when he is involved in, in making it happen? Well, one of the reasons he's talking about climate change is to keep keep the myth alive. And I'll tell you why. Because Al Gore, according to not my numbers, but according to Forbes magazine and the Wall Street Journal in uh, 2014, earned $223 million oh brokering God. carbon offsets and investing in uh, carbon energy uh, stocks. He set up his corporation in the United Kingdom um, under the name of the Generation Investment Management Company. Why the United Kingdom? Because he beats U.S. corporate taxes, which are a lot lower than the U.S. taxes. Um, and uh, I don't know if he's leaving his money offshore or anything else. I couldn't find that, find out that. But I did find out a few things, that he, what he's doing. Number one, he just, if he really believes that the seas are rising, why did he build a $12 million home on the beach in Montesino, California? Um <laughs> He's not the only one. John Kerry also built a home in uh, Martha's Vineyard, uh, right on right on the ocean. So it's uh, you know there's the, a saying that um, everybody else can um, do what they want to do, but in my backyard you can't do it. Exactly, exactly. Uh, one of the things that Al that that Gore said at, at this congressional hearing was that he um, he purchases carbon offsets to espouse his guilt for spending $36,000 a month on oh electricity God. and utilities to heat his pools and his five homes. But what he, didn't, what he didn't tell anybody is that the 
charity, so-called not charity, but at the nonprofit that or that um, he, the money was paid to, he owns it. So oh it's like taking God. the money out of his left hand pocket and putting it in his right. So that's uh, that's part of the problem. People don't know these things, but it, it's it's out there. It's available. That's all part of congressional testimony. Oh um, my God! Why is it uh, today? Why are people not believing all of this? Because they're being gaslighted. You tell the same. You tell a lie time and time and time again, and you start to believe it. And that's exactly <laughs> what's happening. Okay, so next question. Recently, you were at the Ben, the Leadership Business Council at West Palm Beach with the key speaker, Kevin Sorbo, who is a producer, famous actor, and author. We all know him as Hercules. Let's talk about that and other engagements you want to bring up. Well, I, I am on the board of directors of the Leadership Business Council, and that is a C-suite uh, leadership organization. We have uh, phenomenal, when I say phenomenal speakers that come in uh, once a month. For example, we've had John Scully, who was a former CEO of Apple, Bernie Marcus, and Ken Langone, who founded Home Depot, um, Charles Koch and Koch Industries, um, all kinds of amazing, amazing people that we have coming in. Um, so these, it's an organization that's there. Uh, Kevin uh, spoke a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Kevin's a friend of mine. And um, as a matter of fact, he is reading the script to my latest novel that we may be uh, producing. Um, I was fortunate enough to write the script with a Hollywood producer together who wrote uh, Blindside and Some of All Fears. And um, I, um, we're putting it together. We have some meetings going on in the next few weeks. So there may be a movie in the offering in, a, in about six months or so. So we'll see what happens. That's the, that's the organization I belong to. And it's it's an amazing organization. I've been a member for over 18 years. And uh, we meet, as I say, once a month in uh, West Palm Beach. And uh, we have phenomenal speakers, absolutely phenomenal speakers. So, oh, my God. That's wonderful. Yes. Yeah. I, I understand you won two National Literary Awards for your last two books. Tell us about those awards. And well, um, I wrote, um, I actually won, won four awards, but uh, my two novels, uh, my first novel, which was a book on terrorism called The Conversion Prophecy, was a finalist as a, in the thriller category by the... Uh, Next Generation Independent Book Awards in 2016. I also won um, the uh, Reader's Choice Award for that year, which is the equivalent of uh, if, of a, um, I guess, a Grammy. If it was a song, I would probably want a Grammy. My next book after that, my next uh, novel was a romance novel. It's the one we, we're probably going to produce, uh, hopefully within the next six months or so. Won the award. Um uh, Again, as a finalist, as in the romance category, and Yahoo Newsfeed said that if there's one romance novel you read in 2023, this should be it, and that was titled "Under the Divi Tree: True Love Needs No Reason." So um, that was a, a a great plus. Do and you plus. like writing fiction, or do you like writing nonfiction? I like both. I uh, you know I'm try to, I try to be as creative as I can when I when I'm writing fiction, but uh, I find that. Uh, nonfiction is, is probably a lot easier to write because um, most of it is cut and paste. There's a lot of uh, footnotes and you can quote other experts in the field. And then you, you know, you put your opinion to it afterwards. And then um, you put that all together and you give it, you give it a conclusion. So nonfiction is a little easier to write. Uh, you've got to be very creative with, uh, with novels and fiction. So, you know, people have said to me, um, what do you do about writer's block? I said, well, writer's block is very simple. It's when my characters stop talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, well, what do you do? I said, I give them time. They come around. <laughs> so, so uh, and, and I've written, I've, I've, I've been, I've had the ability to write two or three books at the same time. I've done a nonfiction book, a business, a business book and a novel at the same time. If I get writer's block on one, I can go to the other and I, I bounce back and forth sometimes. So it's um, it, it's interesting. I have a different style of writing than most writers. I uh, I know how I want the story to begin. I know how I want it to end. So I write the beginning, I write the ending, and then I fill in the blanks in between. 
And I sometimes don't write my chapters in order. I'll write them as I see them or as I feel them. And um, then I'll just move them around like pieces on a chessboard so that they fit. And then uh, it's a final book. And then, of course, then it goes to your editors and your publisher. And everybody has to put their two cents in and it works. Who publishes your books? Right now I'm, I'm being published by uh, Book Locker. Published Bounce. by Green Dragon, but I, I moved over to Book Locker. Uh, Why and, did you move over? Um, they uh, they made me a better offer. <laughs> That's usually, a good usually reason. that works, you know. It's like selling a house, you know. You take your best offer. Okay, you uh, write different books, and um, you spend all your time doing that. What do you do on your spare time <laughs> if you write so many books? And basically, uh, you know, well, for relaxation, I play golf and, uh, you know, and exercise. But um, in my spare time, I uh, uh, I basically do uh, motivational and, and political and uh, climate change uh, talks uh, to different companies and different organizations and groups. Uh, the last major climate change talk I gave was in uh, Shanghai on a cruise ship with about 250 people in the audience. I've got one coming up uh, on April 1st. Um, I've also been on over 350 TV and radio shows as a uh, terrorist analyst because I used to be with a detective in the New York Police Department uh, in the Intelligence and Division and the Organized Crime Control Division. So, Where are um, you going? Do the climate change book? Believe it or not, that one is, is the, that talk is is uh, is local. It's not it's uh, here in Fort Lauderdale in okay. Florida. That sounds great. Tell the audience where they can go to listen to you. Uh, we're not sure of the venue yet. I've just, uh, we're, they're still trying to work out the venue depending on how many people uh, they have in attendance. But it's probably going to be either in Boca or Fort Lauderdale. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Michael, you're a political commentator and very outspoken about climate change and politics, which we love, by the way. Let's open Pandora's box. Are there some things going on in your country right now that disturbs you and why? Yeah, everything everything about about the climate uh, movement is, is an, an absolute lie. Uh, and not only not only these aren't only my words, Susan. Uh, I have quotes in my book from 23 scientists who used to be with the United Nations IPCC who have absolutely walked away and quit. I'll give you an idea of some of the quotes that they, they've given me. Okay. Uh, for example, in the uh, <clears throat> Dr. Aram Alawa, who is a uh, Indian geologist from Punjab University in India, said that the IPCC has become a closed circuit. It does not listen to anything that other scientists have said. It doesn't. It has. It doesn't have any open minds, and he's amazed that the Nobel Pri Peace Prize has been given on a scientifically incorrect conclusion by people who are not scientists. Dr. Stephen J. Parr, who was a PhD in astrophysicist, a chemist who was part of the International uh, Panel on Climate Change, said that he has authored over 83 peer-reviewed publications in the areas of climate change and atmospheric chemistry, air pollution, and vehicle emissions. And he's quoted as saying that temperature measurements show that the climate model predicted by the mid troposphere hot zone is totally non-existent. This is more than sufficient to invalidate any global climate uh, models and projections that have ever been made. And the Alabama state climatologist, Dr. John Christie of the University of Alabama, who served as a UN IPCC lead author in 2001, said that I was at the table with three European scientists who were members of a panel and we were having lunch. They were talking about their role as lead officers, as lead, lead authors to the IPCC. And they were talking about how they were trying to make the report so dramatic that the United States government would have to sign the Kyoto Protocol no matter what. That's, no. that's the amazing part about it. Now, the final thoughts of my book, I'll tell you what who this was. Dr. Richard Lisden is is the lead science professor from MIT. He runs the department there. And he was an American atmosphere physicist known for his work in the dynamics of atmosphere and atmospheric tides and ozone photochemistry. That's what he was known for. I sent him an email uh, to MIT uh, two years ago 
because I've done over two years worth of research for this book. And uh, I was I got an email back that um, he retired and he moved away and they are forwarding all his emails. Nine days before my book was actually going for print, it was a Saturday afternoon, about 4.30 in the afternoon, my phone rings, my cell phone rang, and it was Dr. Lisden. He was calling me from Paris, which meant it was about 11.30 in the evening there on a Saturday night. And he spent over an hour on the phone with me going over my manuscript. And What did he say? Well, what he said was this. He said to me, can I give you a quote? And I said, can I use it in my book? He said, absolutely. He said, you can use anything. He was the lead scientist running the, the United uh, Nations IPCC. And he resigned along with the 23 other scientists because the UN Peer Review Committee keeps changing their findings. Their mission statement, the UN's mission statement, is to find scientists who are under the opinion, not empirical science, but under the opinion that man is responsible. And anytime they came out with a report that said man is not responsible, they changed the report. And that's why they quit. There are 195 members of the IPCC, of which none of them are scientists. They're all politicians. I wound up calling my publisher Monday morning, and I said, we've got to start, basically stop the presses. The book was going to print the end of that week. And I said, I have one more chapter to end. And this is the chapter, and I'll read it to you because it's only one paragraph, and it was written by Richard Lisden. And I'm quoting his words as the final thoughts of my book because I couldn't say it better. And here's what he said, quote, what historians will definitely wonder about in future centuries is how deeply flawed logic obscured by shrewd and unrelenting propaganda actually enabled a coalition of powerful special interests to convince nearly everyone in the world that carbon dioxide from human industries was a dangerous planet-destroying toxin. It will be remembered as the greatest mass delusion in the history of the world that carbon dioxide, the lifeblood of plants, and all other living matter on this planet was once considered for a time to be a deadly poison, unquote. And that's how my book closes. And it was written by him. Um, now, it, let it, me ask you something. Yeah. You mentioned the IPP. Tell our audience what the IPP is. Well, that's the International Planet uh, Control Commission by the United Nations. It was a, a group that was set up to study the effects of climate. See, there are two things, Susan. When it when we get snow in the middle of, of, of August, or for example, in 19... In, um, 1997, when it, uh, 1977, excuse me, when it snowed and they had two inches of snow in Miami, that's not climate change. That's a weather anomaly. It snowed once in the last 50 years there. That's a weather anomaly. The reason that the, suddenly all of a sudden they're saying there's so many more tornadoes, it's there aren't any more tornadoes than there were 100 years ago. The problem is, it's not a problem, but the, the reason for it is, is because our, our reporting and our... Uh, or equipment that we use to detect them is is greater and better. So we're detecting them earlier and we're detecting more of them. That's what it is. And the seas are not rising, Susan. I'm going to give you an example why the seas are not rising. The oceans are not rising. Let's look at some historical facts that, that you cannot deny. The Statue of Liberty has been in New York Harbor over 136 years. I have photographs of it the day after it was, when it was um, inaugurated and commemorated at the water level it was at that day and at high tide, the same level of water today that exists 136 years later is the same. It hasn't changed. The Little Mermaid, the statue in Copenhagen that's been sitting on the shore since 1913, the level of water from that is now consistent with what it is today. Plymouth Rock that's been sitting on the shores in Plymouth, Massachusetts for 404 years it still hasn't gotten wet. It's still 40 feet from the beach. It has not gotten wet. So the oceans are not rising. And the greatest effect to show you that to, that the, the politicians in this world, in plain English, are pulling the wool over our eyes, is 19, 2021 at the G7 conference in the UK. The best example is that those members of the G7 stood on the beach on a platform at Caribbean Bay to show the effects of the seas rising behind them. Someone forgot to show them a photo of the exact same beach area that was taken 125 years ago that shows the water at the same level. 
The seas are not rising. And the press and the media are behind this movement. Because to give you an example, there was a tide in Miami where the streets flood during high tide. The reason for it is, is the moon is almost 40,000 miles closer to the earth. We learned this in public school, that the moon controls the tides. Right. But So they show you the streets flooding during high tide. But what they don't show you is low tide, where the tide is lower, and there are sandbars which have developed during low tide, and pleasure boats can't get out of the harbor. But they're not showing you that. They only show you high tide. So Let me ask you something, Michael. Yes. The, what do you think about the, um, the news, the way they tell the news? The, what they're doing is they're, they're lying through them through uh, uh, omissions. For example, by showing you high tides but not showing you low tide, that's an omission. So they get you believing. They get you believing that, oh, my God, the streets are flooding every time the tide comes in. And then they tell you it's because the ice is melting. That's not true because of Archimedes' principle of science. Through, if all the sea ice melted tomorrow in the oceans, we would not lose a half inch of beach anywhere in the world because it's displacement. If you filled a glass with ice above the rim and poured ice and filled it with water right to the edge of the glass on the top, and that ice was floating above it, when that ice melts, that glass will never overflow. It's displacement, Susan. It can't happen. And okay. it's the same thing that happens whether it's a glass of water with ice in it, a swimming pool with a brick of ice in it, or the ocean with, with, uh, with icebergs. When they melt, there's not him. Two, 150 years ago, Greenland didn't have any ice. There were no glaciers there. That's why they call it Greenland. It used to be farm country. It used to be all green. It's developed over the last 100 years. These are cyclical changes that take thousands of years. The warmest period on record in the history of the world was 18,000 years ago, the Helio Maximo period. And if it wasn't for that, the United States would still be under ice because this was a giant glacier. We would okay. be enjoying nothing. It's amazing. Let me ask you something. What do you think of Biden and his policies regarding climate change? He has His policies regarding the climate change is scaring the living hell out of me because he's spending trillions of dollars on something that can't be changed. The Paris Climate Accord has nothing to do with climate. It has to do with pollution. And, all, and half of corporate America is not behind the movement, and I'll tell you why. Let's look at the Coca-Cola company. Everybody, they keep telling people they're going green, they're going green. They still produce their beverages in plastic bottles. Let's right. go back to using glass and recycle the glass the way we used to when I was growing up. It's all about money and politics. It's all isn't about it? money. That's all it is. All the dirty water, all the plastic floating in the ocean is not going to change the climate. It's just going to make the earth and the water and the air dirtier. I am okay. for clean air and clean energy all over the world. I used to go camping with my father when, we was, when I was a child. My father grew up on a farm. Everything we took into the woods, we took out. And if we, saw, we found any garbage in the woods when we were camping or fishing, we picked it up and we took it out with us and we threw it away in the trash. What do you I, think of the green movement? It's a joke. There is no green movement. Perfect example, electric vehicles. The dirtiest car in the world are EVs. Why? Because it takes 16,000 gallons of fossil fuel to mine the lithium ore to manufacture the batteries for one Tesla. In order to, in order to break even on the carbon and the pollution that goes into the air, from mining all of that lithium in China or in the rest of the world where they're, where they're doing it, you have to drive a, a vehicle 47,000 miles just to break even. And by that time, you need a new set of batteries, so you got to drive it another 47,000 miles. <laughs> it, it's ridiculous. A Chevy Malibu internal combustion engine uses up, produces less carbon than an electric vehicle. That's a fact. That's a what, scientific fact. What do you, you cannot, think? Of you me? cannot change in, in imperial empirical science. It can't happen. Okay. What do you think of the um the the models that are mixtures, the hybrids? 
They're fine. They're better because they use a combinate a combination of, of fossil fuel and and carbon. And those cars don't have the massive batteries, the massive batteries that um, that the Teslas or, or the other electric vehicles have because they run their electricity to run the car on electricity is produced by the car itself, by its right. own uh, regulators and generators. Right. And what do you think of uh, Trump? Under his administration, what did he do about climate change? Oh. I try not to get into that, but it's um, one of the things he did, and not only him, but so did uh, George uh, Bush did. They didn't sign the Kyoto Protocol, thank God, and he did, and he and he wouldn't sign the Paris Climate Accord because it would have cost us a trillion dollars a year for the next ten years, and nothing would have changed. It's no different than the Great Society program that the. Uh, that J Lyndon Johnson put into effect where he stole three trillion dollars from the Social Security Fund to fight poverty and and, um, and and nothing's changed in 60 years. No kidding. Well, this is a great show. And I want to tell you what's in store for your fans and how can they get in touch with you? Well, um, they could vote for me with the, the Columbia University because my book, Allegory, was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, but I doubt very much if it's going to win it because I'm going against the grain of the Woke uh, Institute. And uh, I would probably imagine that uh, winning the Pulitzer, my chances of winning Powerball are probably greater. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, they can reach me on my website, which is michaelsolomonbooks.com. That's Solomon, of course, is spelled with all O's, S-O-L-O-M-O-N. Uh, my books are available on Amazon or any bookseller that they choose, uh, Barnes & Noble or, uh, or any bookseller out there, their local bookstores, which I believe uh, they should shop in. They should take, they should uh, uh, really uh, shop in their local bookstores, their independent stores. Um, and that's basically it. Uh, my The announcements of my appearances are usually on my website or on my LinkedIn page uh, or on my Facebook page. Um, and that's basically basically it. So. Okay, so thank you very much, Michael, for being a guest on my show. It's my been pleasure, a great Susan. Pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, and uh, you have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you very thank much. Thank you.